She's become a trusted member of the household, caring for the couple when they need her the most. But there's still that side of her, that darkness that just won't go away. And when she sees the valuables, sparkling jewels and bright gold going in the safe, that part of her wakes up again. And soon, nothing else will matter. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 145, The Murder of Marie Frevet. Today's episode is brought to you by Dialabed, South Africa's largest branded bedding retailer. We all know that getting a great night's sleep makes us happier and healthier, so Dialabed is on a mission to make it as easy as possible for you. Shop at 76 stores nationwide or online at dialabed.co.za. A huge thank you to Dialabed for supporting True Crime South Africa. Since 2019, True Crime South Africa has been telling the stories of the victims of violent crime in South Africa. The podcast is independent. That means no big or even little corporates fund it. And that's just the way I like it. And it's the only independent podcast in South Africa that consistently charts in the top 10. Keeping a podcast like this going is time consuming. And for the most part, it remains a one-woman process. It's me. I'm the one woman. You, yes you, are the reason this podcast continues to flourish and help bring in tips on missing person and cold cases. If you'd like to help keep the show running, please consider supporting our sponsors, signing up to Patreon or PayPal, follow the show on the socials, as the kids say, and share it with your fellow partners in crime. You can find our social links and learn more about our sponsors at True Crime South Africa forward slash donate. Shout out to this week's Patreon and PayPal superstars. A huge thank you goes out to Eloise Stain, Trish, Donna Kendall Ball, Anri Ulefia, and Adal Beneka for your support on Patreon. Thank you so much, everyone. Patreon supporters get one additional exclusive episode a month, a shout-out on the pod, and other exclusive content, including Q&As with me, as and when it's available. It's a minimum of $1 a month. I think you should do it. Please. And thank you. Keba. If there's one overriding lesson I've learned from creating this podcast and talking about these cases of violent crime in South Africa, it's that strangers are by far not the most dangerous people in our lives. I've said it many times before, and I'll continue to say it, because when we picture a person that might hurt us, we almost always picture a face we don't know, certainly not one that's close to us who may have cared for us or claimed to only want the best for us. That face is never the one that comes up when we think about danger. But in my experience on this podcast so far, it's almost always the face that's involved in the end. In researching this case, I used the legal judgment from the trial a chapter from Julian Janssen's book, Stellenbosch, Murder Town, and several media articles. So let's get into episode 145, The Murder of Marie Fervey. The following episode may contain sensitive material, including descriptions of violence, sexual assault, or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Marie Favey and her husband Stephen had bought a house together in Paradeiskloof, Stellenbosch in 1995 and turned it into a guest house soon after 
which they called Villa Mava. Marie loved caring for the guests who visited Villa Mava, and the responsibilities of the guest house would get her through some very trying times when her husband developed cancer. Marie had also had a battle with cancer and survived, and so when her husband was diagnosed, she'd perhaps hoped his fights would have the same outcome. Marie tried to keep the staff members at the guest house to a minimum, doing as much as she could herself. She and Stephen did have a woman who had worked for them for more than two decades in the role of housekeeper, and Emily Julius fit seamlessly into the household. When Stephen fell ill, though, the duty of care became too much for Marie and Emily, so a new carer was hired to assist. Nicole Haldenhaus lived in nearby Paul in 2014 when she started working for the Furveys, and she'd recently finished working at a hospital. Before that, she'd worked at several restaurants as a seasonal farm worker. What the Furveys would not know, though, is that Nicole had had a very rough beginning in the world, and some of that had not quite left her. Nicole was raised predominantly by her grandmother. Her father had left her mother when her and her siblings were very young and hadn't contributed financially. Her mother struggled to make ends meet and admitted that Nicole's childhood was, quote, hell on earth. Nicole started to exhibit negative behaviours as she moved into her teens, and by the time she was 14, she'd run away from home. She lived between friends and sometimes on the streets for two years, until she returned home when she was 16. Her family said that at this time it really seemed as though she wanted to start afresh and change her life. She started working and contributing to the community and church projects, and things seemed to be going really well. Nicole would have two children during this time who she cared for, and although her life in general was looking up and it appeared as though she may be able to break the cycle of her challenging childhood, when she was working at a restaurant, she fell foul of the law. Although the details of the crime are not available, Nicole was convicted of a financial crime which seemed to include her having stolen the restaurant's money. It doesn't appear that she was given a prison sentence for this crime, but it was on her criminal record, and when Nicole applied for the position in the Favez household, she was asked whether she had a criminal record, and she didn't inform the couple of what she'd been convicted of in the past. Now, this is not uncommon for people who've made some mistakes in their past and ended up with a criminal record. It's incredibly difficult for most people to find employment and even more so when you have a bit of a questionable past. Of course, she should not have lied to the Fervais, and it would seem that this would eventually be only the first of many lies, and even deeper deceptions Nicole would be guilty of. She was hired by the Fervais, though, and seemingly did a good job of caring for Stephen. Sadly, Stephen Fervais passed away later on in 2014, but Nicole stayed on to help Marie, whose health was also not great. Although her shifts were reduced, Nicole still helped with small tasks Marie needed assistance with. She would paint her nails, help her to get around the house, change her into her night clothes, and, and read to her from the Bible. After Stephen passed away, the Favet's son, Francois, moved in to help his mom with the guest house and keep her company he started to notice that Nicole very often told lies, sometimes about small things that happened around the house, but very often about where she was on the day she failed to report for duty. Eventually, Francois had caught the woman in one too many lies, and he informed her that they would no longer be using her services. For a long time, Marie was cared for by other carers during the day, and Emily Julius remained as a steadfast and trusted member of staff. She had been friendly with Nicole while she was working there, and often asked the woman to arrange boxes of grapes from a contact she had. 
After Nicole was no longer working in the home, Emily still occasionally spoke to her and ordered grapes from her. During 2016, Nicole contacted the Fervais. She told them she missed the family and asked if they had any shifts available for her to care for Marie. She'd be grateful to work for them again. Marie Fervais was a soft-hearted woman. She knew that Nicole had children to feed, and she was willing to give her a second chance, with just a few shifts to start off with. Everything went well enough, and on the 12th of February 2017, Nicole arrived for and successfully completed another shift at the Fervais. Four days later, on Thursday the 16th of February, around lunchtime, Marie Favay asked her housekeeper Emily to walk to the shop for a few items they needed. Marie had a hankering for oxtail stew and asked if Emily would walk to the supermarket, which was just 850 metres from the guest house, and see if they had any. Emily agreed and set off. She left the front door open to let some air circulate through the house on the hot summer's day and locked the security gate. Marie was very security conscious, and even though the neighbourhood was relatively safe as far as South African neighbourhoods go, Marie wasn't taking any chances, and knew very well that bad things could happen without warning. In fact, Marie wasn't just security conscious, especially since her husband had died and her son worked outside of the house during the day. She had a very specific fear that someone would break into her house and murder her with a knife. It's likely that this specific nightmare was so horrifying to Marie because at 81 years old and with several different physical ailments, she found it difficult to get around a lot of the time without assistance, and she usually used a walking device to stand up. She likely knew that there was simply no way she'd be able to flee from an attacker. That afternoon, Emily Julius made her way to the store, picked up the items Marie had requested, and then walked back to the house. When she arrived, she immediately saw that the front door was closed. She thought maybe the wind had blown it closed, but when she unlocked the security gate and tried to turn the doorknob, it didn't budge. It was locked. She knocked, and when Marie didn't respond, she walked around to the back of the property. There she found all the security gates unlocked and standing open. Emily tried phoning Marie on her cell phone and the landline, but there was no answer. The woman felt very strange about what was happening, and decided to go next door and ask the neighbour to enter the house with her. The man living next door had known the Favais for many years and was more than happy to assist Emily, hoping Marie hadn't fallen and injured herself. He also understood that Emily was afraid to enter the house on her own, so he told her to wait in the backyard, and he entered the house through the kitchen. He slowly made his way up the passage, calling out to Marie with no answer. Then he stepped into the lounge, and he understood why Marie was not answering. 81-year-old Marie Favet was seated in her favourite chair. It was the chair that was most comfortable to her aching bones, and she spent more time sitting there than anywhere else in the house most days. The man was used to seeing Marie in the chair when he occasionally visited, but on this day, Marie had been savagely attacked in the chair. Blood covered the woman's clothes and skin from head to toe and had begun to pool at her feet. The neighbour could find no signs of life. Marie Favet had been murdered in her own home. The mobile panic button she wore around her neck had seemingly been useless to her in that moment. The neighbour ran outside and told Emily to phone police. He then walked through the house and made sure no one was hiding in any of the rooms, and while he waited for police, tried to see if he could find any evidence of how entry had been made to the house. 
All he could find was a single footprint near the swimming pool, which would later be found not to have been linked to the crime at all. Emily swore that the gates were locked when she left, so Marie had to have opened the door to her murderer. Sadly, Marie's son, Francois, would discover that his mother had been murdered on a neighbourhood WhatsApp group. Neighbours began sending alarmed texts to the group about police cars arriving outside Villa Mava, and then someone mentioned the elderly owner had been murdered. He rushed home to find the house cordoned off. He was stopped from entering the property by police officers, who explained that his mother was far beyond help and they couldn't allow him to contaminate the scene. He stood, helplessly watching as more officers arrived and finally forensic technicians and the pathology service. Francois was completely shocked. He'd spoken to his mother on the phone at 11am that morning, about an hour before she was brutally murdered. Forensic techs would work at the scene until midnight, but in the meantime, one of Stellenbosch's best detectives was on the case. Even before Sergeant Stephen Adams arrived at Villa Mava, he was already drawing possible leads from the surrounding streets. He noticed two houses near the murder scene that had CCTV cameras angled onto the street and made a note to check in with those residents later on. Upon arriving at the house, Adams surveyed the scene and once Marie's body had been removed, asked Francois to walk through the house with him and let him know if anything had been taken. Marie's cell phone was missing and Francois discovered that a significant amount of jewellery was missing from the two safes in the house. The safes had been unlocked, using the keys that Marie carried with her everywhere. On the same bunch were the keys to all the doors in the house, including the front door, which had been found locked when it was left unlocked when Emily left for the shop. The value of the jewellery stored in the safes, as well as a pricey camera Francois had purchased for his mother as a gift years before, was about 700,000 rand. Sergeant Adams set about getting more information from Francois about his mother, her business, and the staff members they had hired over the years. The nature of the murder seemed very personal. Even before having the autopsy results, Adams could see that Marie had been stabbed a huge number of times, and the viciousness of this spoke to anger and very likely a personal connection. In addition, it seemed the killer, or killers, also had intimate knowledge of the house, where the keys were kept, and where the most valuable items were. Francois was happy to hand over all the information of the people they'd employed in the past, but said they'd only really had one negative experience with an employee, and that was with Nicole Heldenhuis. There had been three guests booked into the guest house that day. None of them had checked in by the time the murder occurred, thankfully, but all were turned away, and had to find alternative accommodation as they arrived to see the guest house surrounded by police cars. On his way back to the office that evening, Adams stopped in at the two houses he'd identified as having cameras. One resident unfortunately told the officer his cameras actually didn't record, and they were just for him to see what was happening in the street outside his home without him having to go outside. The other resident, though, was happy to share his footage with the detective and said he would call Adams as soon as it was downloaded and ready for him. Early the next morning, Sergeant Adams looked up Nicole Heldenhase's address and paid her a visit. The woman was at home with her boyfriend, Romeo Hendricks. As Adams entered the property, he noticed a white Nissan Sentra with a black bonnet parked on the premises. He asked Nicole where she'd been the day before. She claimed she and Romeo had been doing a few errands and they dropped his mom off in Choda. Adams asked if they'd used the Sentra parked in the yard, and Nicole said no, it wasn't running. At the end of the conversation, Adams informed Nicole that Marie Favet had been murdered. 
Nicole appeared shocked and horrified at the news, and Adams told her to remain available for phone calls and visits, as he may want to speak with her again. Later that afternoon, the resident of Marie's street with the footage called Adams and he went out to view it. He watched as Emily Julius passed the camera walking to the shop, just as she said she'd had. Not long afterwards, a car passed the camera and parked in front of Villa Mather. The vehicle appeared to contain four occupants. It was a white Nissan Sentra with a black bonnet. Less than 48 hours after Marie Favey's murder, Nicole Heldenhuis and her boyfriend, Romeo Hendricks, were taken into custody. Adams confirmed that the Sentra was indeed running. In the back seat, he also found a camera bag with the same very expensive brand of camera Francois had mentioned buying his mother. He would later confirm that it was the same camera. Nicole Heldenhuis almost immediately admitted that she'd played a role in the crime, although her versions thereof would change, and her ultimate believed level of involvement would not match up with the evidence that would come out. She told Adams that she'd let slip to Romeo Hendricks about the jewellery she'd seen at the Favet's home. She'd allegedly seen Francois putting the items into the safe one day and was shocked at how much had been there. After Romeo had the information, she said a plan had been formed to rob Marie, but she claimed that murder was never supposed to be part of the plan. Both Heldenhuis and Hendricks were held in custody. On the Saturday following the murder, Marie's autopsy was conducted. The pathologist recorded between 50 and 65 stab wounds on the woman's body. She'd stopped counting at 50, because some wounds were doubled over, where she'd been stabbed twice in one place, and it became difficult to identify original wounds. It was also apparent that the wounds had a pattern. Marie had definitely been stabbed while in the sitting position she'd been found in, and it appeared that she'd been simultaneously stabbed from both the left and right-hand sides, very possibly by two separate attackers at once. Marie had sustained defensive wounds to her hands as she tried to fight back, but she'd been unable to get up because both her walker had been moved away from the chair and the sheer ferocity of the attack would have blindsided her. Several of the stab wounds in Marie's neck would have been fatal on their own and had severed main arteries, accounting for the huge amount of blood on and around her body. When Nicole and Romeo appeared in court on Monday morning, Romeo seemed shocked to hear that Nicole was claiming she'd known nothing about the murder and had only believed a robbery was going to take place. A date for a bail hearing was set, and Nicole's legal aid lawyer indicated that they would be requesting bail for her as she was pregnant with Romeo's child, and the conditions in jail were not healthy for her. Shortly after they'd appeared, Sergeant Adams made another two arrests. During Nicole's confession, she'd implicated two other men in being involved in the murders. Enrico Malharba and Andre Kutsia were associates of Romeo Hendricks. Nicole alleged that it had been Malharba who had actually stabbed Marie, and she'd had no idea he was going to do it until it was happening. All four were denied bail, and as they waited for their trial to begin, Nicole would eventually give birth to Romeo's baby in Polsmore Prison. When the trial finally began in August 2018, all four were asked to plead to both murder and robbery charges. Romeo Hendricks pleaded not guilty to both. He claimed he'd only driven the car and had no idea why they were there, what was stolen, or that there was a murder. Nicole Heldenhuis, despite having confessed to masterminding the robbery, also pleaded not guilty to both murder and robbery. Andre Kutsia pleaded guilty to being involved in the robbery, but claimed he'd only helped to carry bags out of the house 
and he hadn't known anything about the murder. Enrico Malhaba gave the states a great stride forward in their case when he pleaded guilty to both the murder and the robbery charges. His plea statement would likely be the closest Marie's family would ever get to the truth. Enrico Malhaba said that on the 16th of February 2017, Romeo Hendricks had arrived at his home in a white Nissan Sentra with a black bonnet. With him were Nicole Haldenhuis and Andre Kutsia. He'd been advised of the plan to rob and murder Marie Favet earlier in the week, and he'd agreed to take part. He hadn't told his living girlfriend anything, as he didn't want her to be involved, and all the discussions that morning had taken place outside their house, so she didn't hear. He said Nicole Haldenhuis had been very much aware that the murder was part of the plan, and she'd even mentioned that Emily Julius may be present too, and if she was, they'd have to kill her as well. Emily Julius was actually, unwittingly, part of the ruse. Julius often ordered grapes from Nicole, and it would be this that Nicole would use to gain access to the house. She called earlier in the day to tell Marie that she would be popping in to drop off Emily's grapes. While at Malhaba's house, Nicole had actually asked his girlfriend if she had any grapes for her, seemingly wanting to further improve her ruse when she arrived at Marie's door. The woman hadn't had any, but it didn't seem to matter. All Nicole needed to do was pretend to have something with her, so Marie unlocked the door. Malhaba said that the car had been borrowed from someone else, the man who owned it was aware it was going to be used in a crime, but was given immunity from prosecution for his testimony, and the foursome had borrowed money to put fuel in the tank. Nicole had given Malhaba a knife which he was to use to kill Marie and Emily if necessary. When the four had left his house, they'd gone to a nearby train station and stolen license plates off a parked vehicle, they replaced the plates on the car with the stolen ones and headed out to Paradise Kluif. When they arrived at Villa Mava, they'd parked in the street and Nicole had approached the house. Marie had come to the door and told her Emily was at the shops, but she could wait for her. Nicole knew very well that Marie was very safety conscious and she wouldn't allow the three men she'd brought with her into her home so the men waited in the car. Nicole settled Marie back into her chair, and then, as they had planned, after a few minutes, Malhaba came to the door and asked for a glass of water. Nicole asked Marie's permission to give the man some water, and she agreed. Malhaba was let inside and waited in the entrance to the lounge. As soon as Nicole returned from the kitchen, she gave him the sign, and the horrendous attack on Marie began. Malherba said that Marie had fought back, and suddenly Nicole appeared beside him with a knife and began to stab Marie from the other side. Soon, the woman became motionless, and Nicole emptied the safes and took Marie's cell phone. As soon as Malherba had gone inside, Romeo had moved the car into the driveway and both he and Andre came into the house after Marie was dead and helped carry out the jewellery to the car. Nicole and Malhaba had been covered in blood, and they would later burn their clothes. They'd been in and out of the house in less than 15 minutes, and Emily Julius had no idea how lucky she was that Marie had sent her to the shop at that very time. Their paths had been so close to crossing that the four had actually seen Emily walking back toward the house as they drove out of the neighbourhood, but she'd never seen the car before and didn't know what she was about to walk into, so she didn't put two and two together. Malhaba said that after the murder they'd gone to the house of an individual who was a known high-ranking member of the 26ers. They'd gone to the man because he was going to help them move the pieces of jewellery safely. 
He allegedly hadn't been involved in the planning of the crime and cooperated with police after the fact by giving Adams a detailed report of what each of the people involved had done and said. He also ended up providing police with voice notes and messages that Nicole had sent him after the murder, in which she'd bragged about the huge haul they'd gotten and how they'd murdered Marie. This was excellent evidence against Nicole's claims that she'd been shocked and horrified that Malhaba had killed Marie. The 26ers member had advised the four on how to split the loot to best sell it and where they could go. Police would end up confiscating some of the jewellery at the businesses the man had referred them to. They'd also gotten CCTV footage from one of the gold purchases, which showed the moment Nicole had gone with Romeo to sell some of the stolen items. She had a broad smile on her face and seemed elated in the footage, again in direct contrast with her claims that she'd been terrified and remorseful that Marie had been killed. Emily Julius was also called to the stand, and she testified that as soon as she heard the jewellery had been stolen, she'd actually tried to get in contact with Nicole, because throughout the years that the women had worked together, Nicole had regularly dropped comments about wanting to get her hands on Marie's jewellery. Emily had always thought Nicole was just talking, but the murder had made her wonder if she'd actually done it. Emily told the court that she'd been employed with the Vevey family for 23 years and she'd been unemployed since the murder as Villa Mava had been shut down. Andre Kutsia had claimed he'd had no idea that a murder had been committed until he was arrested, but his girlfriend would testify that he had told her two days after the crime and just before he was arrested that a woman had been killed during the robbery they'd committed. He also said he'd been so high on drugs that he'd had no idea what was happening and he'd just been along for the ride. This was also proven wrong in court when Kutsia's uncle testified that Andre had told him before the robbery that it was going to happen. After a month of evidence being put forward, which all stood against her, Nicole Heldenhuis told the court in September 2018 that she wanted to tell the truth to clear her conscience. But even then, the truth for Nicole Heldenhuis was a variable concept. She still denied that she'd helped to stab Marie, but admitted that she was aware that there was a chance the woman would be killed and hadn't done anything to stop it when it happened. She still claimed to have been afraid of the men in the group, something which was clearly proven false by the evidence they had of her bravado and excited attitude after the murder. While on the stand, she apologised to Francois. He said he could never accept her apology. Romeo Hendricks continued to claim ignorance of everything and said he was just the driver and he'd never gone inside and hadn't known a murder was going to be committed. In February 2019, the judge was ready to pass down judgments to the four. From the outset, it was clear that he had not believed any of their stories about not being involved or aware of certain aspects of the crime. He described the crime as a pack of hyenas descending on a helpless victim and said that while there were certainly varying degrees of culpability, he found them all guilty of all the charges against them. The judge also noted that Nicole Heldenhuis had been the mastermind in the group. He believed that her plan to rob and murder Marie had been hatched many years prior, possibly even before she'd met Romeo Hendricks, and she was just waiting for the right people to come along to commit the crime with her. During the sentencing phase of the trial, Nicole's childhood challenges were raised in possible mitigation. It also emerged that her behaviour while incarcerated thus far pointed to her possibly having a personality disorder. She had gotten involved in many fights, was impulsive and aggressive, 
manipulative, and behaved in a deviant manner. In June 2019, the judge was ready to sentence the four. Nicole Haldenhuis was described as having acted without remorse or conscience, and as the mastermind of the entire plot, without whom the murder likely never would have happened, she was handed down a life sentence, plus 15 years for the robbery. Romeo Hendricks received a 28-year sentence for the murder, plus 15 years for the robbery. Enrico Malhaba and Andre Kutsia received the same sentence, which was 23 years for the murder and 15 years for the robbery. All sentences would be served concurrently. I think, besides Nicole Haldenhase's coldness toward the woman who trusted her and for whom she'd cared, the thing that bothers me most about this case was the fact that Marie Favet's death precisely matched her worst nightmare. She'd always been terrified of being stabbed to death by an intruder in her home, and that is exactly what happened to her. The fact that she was not able to defend herself or flee just makes it all the more horrifying. After the murder of children, acts of brutality like this toward the elderly and infirm are just completely disgusting crimes. There has to be very little humanity in you for you to think it's okay to savagely take someone's life like this for nothing more than their jewellery. Money that would have gone in a matter of weeks at the rate these four were already spending it. Marie Favet had survived many challenges in her life. She still lived with the grief of her husband's death and she'd survived cancer and so many other illnesses and health issues to continue on with her quiet life, running her guest house and making visitors' trips to Stellenbosch enjoyable and comfortable. The one thing Marie could not survive, though, that she had no way to see or defend herself from, was the collision of greed and absolute cold-bloodedness that ran through the veins of her killers. Marie Favet, breast gently. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on Spotify or the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Live Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon.